All right, this is section 1.4. We're going to talk about delay and loss and throughput in packet switch networks. First question, how do loss and delay occur in networks? Well, looking at this diagram, we see that we've got two hosts, A and B, that are sending packets to this router. And the white, in this case, represents, or all, these slots represent the queue. This router can send it at a certain speed, a certain number of packets per second, um, and if the arrival rate to the router is faster than its sending rate, then it will have to queue the packets that are arriving while it's sending others. So we can see here that we've got what, about three slots still empty, three slots in the queue that can hold more packets um, while we're waiting. So there are a couple sources of delay, and that's what we're going to talk about first that arise in this system. The first is there is a delay associated with actually transmitting the packet. It takes some time to put the bits on the wire or in the air, whatever the medium is. Um, and that's called the transmission delay. Um, if there is a line, if there's a queue of packets waiting to be sent, then there'll be some time where the packets are just sitting there waiting. That's the queuing delay. So that's two ways that delay can happen. We're also um, interested in when loss can happen. And not surprisingly, loss happens when the queue is full. So if, this, if those three slots get filled up and then another packet arrives, where is it going to go? It can't be stored temporarily because there's no space for it. So that router will just drop it. It'll be dropped, and uh, in that case, we would have to... We would, if, that, if it's important to get that packet through, hopefully it'll be sent again. There'll be some mechanisms further up in the, in the stack to take care of that. Okay, here are the four sources of packet delay. So it's the two that we mentioned before plus two more. Um, we talked about the queuing and transmission. Let's talk about processing and propagation. Those two words both start with P, but let's not get them confused. Propagation is the time that it takes for the signal to actually move across the medium. All right, so typically this is going to be a short amount of time because the propagation speeds are very fast. Uh, typically the propagation speed is going to be something um, that's related to the speed of light. So that's a good thing, right? So if we're sending uh, uh, an electrical signal, it's going to be, uh, it depends on the medium itself, but it, I think the book says it's on the order of 2 times 10 to the 8th meters per second, which I know is just, it's, known, it's not a number you can identify with, but this is super fast, um, the propagation. However, if you have to go a long way, it might be a lot. For example, if you're sending packets through a satellite in space, and you've got to go you know, way up into space and then way back down again, and that propagation delay is actually going to be significant and is going to contribute to the overall time. Um, so that's propagation. How long does it take for that the bits to actually go the, the physical distance um, on the medium? The processing is the, the processing, the computational things that the router has to do. Uh, those are things like checking to see if the packet has bit errors, there are errors in it and it's doing some checking on that. That takes time. Um, if it's figuring out what output link this packet needs to go to based on the address that the, the destination address that's in the packet, that kind of processing also is going to be included in the processing time. All right, so we've got to process the packet. It may have to wait in line. That's a queuing delay. Once it's at the front of the line, it'll be the bits will be put on the wire. That's the transmission delay. And once the bits are on the wire, it has to propagate to the destination. That's the propagation delay. Right? Those are the four sources of packet delay. Any questions on that? What questions do you have? All right, well, the book has this analogy with cars and toll booths uh, that may or may not help you. I don't, you guys know what a toll booth is? You ever, you ever have to do that? I don't, I don't have a lot of toll booths around here, but it's kind of fun, right? Except that you have to pay money. Um, in this example, a car is going to be kind of like a bit, and we're going to have this caravan of 10 cars that represents a packet. All right, this is very cool. 
Um, the toll booths are going to kind of represent routers or uh, maybe hosts if you want to think about it more generally. We're going to say that cars can propagate at 100 kilometers an hour and the toll booth takes 12 seconds to service a car. So that's analogous to the transmission time. So it takes 12 seconds at, at each toll booth. So the question is, how long will it be until the caravan is lined up at the second toll booth? How long does it take to, to push this entire caravan as they're lined up at the first toll booth and get them to be at the second toll booth? Well, the first part is, how long does it take for all of these 10 cars to get through this toll booth? Right, it takes 10 cars times 12 seconds, 120 seconds, 2 minutes, just to get them through. Yeah? Um, so, at what point will the last car be at the second toll booth? At least lined up at the second toll booth. Yes, an hour and two minutes later. It's going to take him 60, or it's going to take him an hour to get from one toll booth to the other toll booth. All right? Okay. So this is a simple example. What we see here is that the, um, the toll booth speed is pretty slow, is pretty, um, or the toll booth delay is small compared to the time that it takes to, get to actually propagate. So in this case, the propagation delay is, is big, and the transmission delay is small. So if we change that around and say, hey, cars can now propagate at 1,000 miles, 1,000 kilometers an hour, um, and it takes one minute to service a car. All right, so you see what we've done? We've really changed the values here. How does this affect our scenario? Well, now how long does it take for these 12 car, this, sorry, these 10 cars to get through the toll booth? It takes 10 minutes, and how long does it take one car to get from um, one toll booth to the next toll booth? Yes. So how long will it take the first car to get um, from this side of the toll booth to this side of the next? Seven. Seven minutes, right. But we said it would take 12 minutes to get all the cars through. So the answer to this question, will cars arrive at the second toll booth before all the cars are serviced at the first, is yes. Um, so the kind of analogous lesson here is that it's possible that the first bit of a packet can arrive at the second router before the packet is fully transmitted at the first. Um, so we've got these kind of weird, um, possible, possibly weird scenarios that can happen based on the delays within our network. And I'm going to show you an equation. Don't freak out. This is the nodal delay, the delay per node. What we're basically all this equation is showing is the four sources of packet delay put together in equation. So the, the total nodal delay is the processing delay plus the queuing delay plus the transmission delay plus the propagation delay. Typically the processing delay is just a few microseconds, microseconds, yeah, pretty small. Um, the queuing delay depends on congestion. It might be nothing if, if, it's, the first, um, if it's the first packet in the line, or it could be a lot. Uh, the transmission delay is always going to be the length of the packet, L, divided by the speed, the rate of transmission, R. So L divided by R is going to be the transmission delay. Um, and if that R is really um, what, small, if you have a very s slow link, like a dial-up modem, you remember those? Um, then transmission delay itself may be very large. Uh, the propagation delay is maybe from a few microseconds to hundreds of milliseconds, and hundreds of milliseconds is, is actually pretty large, and you, you might be able to feel that. Uh, that's like the, the satellite thing, where it's a really long way that it has to go. Let's talk a little bit more about queuing delay. This is a graph. You guys like graphs? <clears throat> and we're introducing sort of this new term traffic intensity. Let's think about what the, these three components are. L is the length of the packet that we just talked about in bits. 
R is the bandwidth of the link in bits per second, and A is the average packet arrival rate. I'm sorry, you lost the TE there. So it's in um, packets per second. So how many packets per second arrive at the link? So LA over R gives us um, really a measure of how intense the traffic is. Okay, so you can imagine L times A is how many bits per second are arriving at the router to be sent. R is how many bits per second actually can be sent. All right, so LA is how many bits are coming in, R is how many bits are going out. So if we think about if LA over R is close to zero, if this traffic intensity is close to zero, what will be the average queuing delay? How, how long is the queue going to be if, if, uh, if basically if LA is very small and R is very large? If that ratio is that way. Right, there'll be very little queuing delay or none at all because we're basically we're very, it's very easy to send all the packets that we're receiving, so there won't there won't be a line. If LA over R gets close to one, so that means that LA the arrival rate and the sending rate is kind of close to each other. What happens to the queuing delay? It's going to get big. Um, it's going to become very large, right? Um, what happens if LA over R is actually greater than 1? Yes. Um, in fact, I guess mathematically, the delay will be infinite. It's like we're always getting more work than we can ever do. Right? There's no way to catch up. And maybe that's the way you're going to feel this semester. Um, I hope not. No, I hope not. But, you know, that makes sense, right? So kind of this incoming rate of work is greater than the, the output rate of work. It's basically a hopeless situation, so that's not where we want to be. And the graph uh, tries to show that, that as we get close to one, the delay gets bigger and bigger. Um, as we, if you want to look at real internet delays and routes, you can run this program trace route. It's built into uh, most operating systems, and it's, it's a cool program. It's something we'll mess around with in our lab or, uh, and in our homework. Basically, it, um, it sends packets out one hop, two hop, three hop, four hop, five hop, and shows you what route will be taken to some endpoint. And it gives you the, the round trip time uh, for each of those. It does three and gives you an average and a max and a min. Uh, he shows this as an example, but we'll go through this in, with the lab. We've talked about how delay happens. What about packet loss? Basically, if the buffer is full, that is, the storage space for packets that are waiting to be sent, then there's no place to store incoming packets and they have to be dropped. They can't be stored, so they get dropped and are lost. Well, what if the packet is lost? Where will it go? How does this packet ever get through? Well, the lost packet may be retransmitted by a previous node or by the, the original source in system or not at all. It may just depend on the protocols that are at play in the system. So that's what happens if the buffer is full, the packet will be dropped. If the queue is full, it will be dropped. Let's talk a little bit about throughput. Throughput is the rate in bits per time, bits per second say, at which bits are transferred between the sender and the receiver. We could see throughput in terms of the instantaneous throughput or the average throughput. The instantaneous throughput is the rate at some given point in time. The average throughput is the rate over a longer period of time averaged out in bits per second. Uh, as we analyze this, we could kind of imagine here we've got the server with a file of F bits that it's sending to the client and the server's link links to the this shared internet through a, a shared router at RS bits per second <coughs> and the link capacity of uh, the link speed to the client is RC bits per second and we can sort of imagine these as pipes that carry fluid at a certain rate so in this case RS 
is sort of the width the size of this pipe and RC is the size of this pipe, client pipe. So let's think about some relationships that exist here. Um, in this example then, the sending a file is sending some fluid into the pipe. If the server speed is less than the client speed, kind of imagine a smaller pipe here, what's the average end-to-end -end throughput between the server and the client? Well, this should make sense kind of intuitively. Um, it's going to be right, the speed of the server. This RS bits per second is the bottleneck that we can only send that much fluid through. Um, so that's going to be the average throughput. If we turn this thing around and make the client the smaller pipe, then that's going to be the limiting factor in this, how much fluid we can get through per second. So in this case, the average end-to-end -end throughput is going to be RC bits per second, whereas in this case, it was RS bits per second. In networking terms, this is called the bottleneck link. The bottleneck link is the link on the end-to-end -end path that constrains the end-to-end -end throughput. And generally, this is the, the smallest link. You know, the weakest link is the one that determines what the bottleneck is. If we were to consider this in a more internet realistic scenario, where we have several servers and several clients that are connected to each other through some shared pipe that's on the internet, what is the average end-to-end -end throughput in this scenario per connection. And let's imagine that we've got 10 connections that are fairly sharing some backbone bottleneck link. This has the right R, uh, the clients have a link capacity RC, the servers have a link capacity RS. Now in this case, the average throughput is going to be whatever's the smallest. Whether RS is the smallest, then it'll be the average throughput. If RC is the minimum, then that will be the average throughput, or in this case we've got a new variable, if R divided by 10, since there are 10 connections, that is the um, this shared internet speed, the backbone speed, if that R divided by 10 is smaller than RS and RC, then it will be the bottleneck link and will determine the end-to-end -end throughput. In practice, the shared internet backbone speed is not the bottleneck, so usually RC or RS is the bottleneck. So what we've seen in this section is how delay and loss occur in packet switch networks, and we've taken a quick look at how throughput is handled.